Brian, what's on your radar? Well, so this weekend, Axios kicked off a debate about the role the squad is playing in the coming collapse of the Democratic Party. The story itself was extremely thin, which is Axios' style, but this one was even thinner than normal. The case boiled down basically to this, quote, the push to defund the police, rename schools, and tear down statues has created a significant obstacle to Democrats keeping control of the House, the Senate, and the party's overall, me party's overall image, unquote. Okay, so let's get the obvious stuff aside first. You know, the reason Biden has lost much of his popularity is that he hasn't gotten his popular agenda through Congress, and he hasn't gotten his agenda through Congress for two simple reasons. Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, they won't vote for it. If they would vote for it, we'd be in an entirely different political world. And to me, it's pretty obvious that that world in which Democrats actually accomplish something would look better for them. But who knows? So instead, the culprit they've settled on is the squad and slogans like defund the police and abolish ICE. Those positions are too extreme, so the thinking goes, and it turns off normal voters. Now, even though the Axios story doesn't even try to make its case with examples or anything other than quotes from people who have always hated the squad, like Third Way and Josh Gottheimer, I actually do think there's an interesting question buried in there which is worth grappling with. Now, the example being used right now of squad overreach is the recall of three woke San Francisco school board members who, we're told, spent too much time renaming schools and not enough time trying to reopen them. And actually, they didn't try to reopen them at all. They actively tried to keep them closed. But how is that about the squad? Was the squad pushing Democrats to keep schools closed? And what about school renaming? Basically, every annual fundraiser held by every state and county Democratic Party for more than 100 years was known as the Jefferson Jackson Dinner, named for Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson. Those are now problematic fellows, and the dinners have over the years been renamed, and most of them are now simply the J&J &J Dinner or the JJ Dinner. Those names were changed long before the squad was elected to office because party establishment figures themselves believed they should be renamed. More to the point, from 2010 through the end of the Obama presidency, Democrats lost roughly 1,000 state legislative seats. Then in 2016, they lost the presidency to Donald Trump. The squad was elected in 2018. What on earth did they have to do with any of that? The idea that a player who showed up in the last few minutes of a blowout game is somehow responsible for the whole terrible season is just absurd. But let's not dismiss this conversation so easily. Put the squad aside for a moment. The charge from Axios here is that Democrats have a, quote, culture war problem, and let's be honest, they do. Now, most of the history of American politics has been the waging of a culture war one way or another, and oftentimes that's been a righteous struggle, even if it was unpopular. Sometimes the left has gotten the upper hand, and sometimes they haven't. And there's an easy shorthand way to think about when the left has the winning argument and when they don't. Basically, if the public thinks that the position being argued for is authentic and comes from real people facing real hardship, the public will eventually be on their side. If it seems like it's just moral preening from rich white liberals, then nobody wants to hear it. Now, in 2016, when Bernie Sanders challenged Hillary Clinton, he made his campaign specifically about economic issues. Here's how he launched it. I'll just make a brief comment and be happy to take a few questions. We don't have an endless amount of time. I've got to get back. Uh, let me just say this. Uh, this country today, in my view, has more serious crises than at any time since the Great Depression of the 1930s. For most Americans, their reality is that they're working longer hours for lower wages. In inflation-adjusted income, they're earning less money than they used to years ago, despite a huge increase in technology and productivity. So all over this country, I've been talking to people, and they say, how does it happen? I'm producing more, but I'm working longer hours for low wages. My kid can't afford to go to college. I'm having a hard time affording health care. How does that happen? While at exactly the same time, 99% of all new income generated in this country is going to the top 1%. How does it happen that the top 1% owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. And my conclusion is that that type of economics is not only immoral, it's not only wrong, it is unsustainable. It can't continue. 
Clinton took the culture war baton and smashed Bernie over the head with it. She couldn't claim she was more progressive than Sanders on the party's key issues, and so she sought to push those issues off the table and refocus the conversation entirely on racism and sexism, issues that neither candidate had any obvious solutions to, but which could allow Democratic voters to express opposition to by choosing Clinton over Sanders. The perfect distillation of this approach came in an iconic line that became part of her stump speech. If we broke up the big banks tomorrow, and I will, if they deserve it, if they pose a systemic risk, I will, would that end racism? The left was humbled and believed their message needed more intersectional analysis, and their messengers needed to not just be an old white guy. And they weren't necessarily wrong about that. A woman of color running on Bernie's platform, it was assumed, wouldn't be susceptible to the same charges of racism and misogyny. It was with willing arms that the squad was embraced in this atmosphere. Nobody could accuse them of being racist and sexist. The squad came to Congress with aggressive class politics and also aggressive racial justice and gender politics. Through 2020, the Democratic Party pretended that it was on board for both. Nearly every presidential candidate embraced Medicare for All and a Green New Deal. Even Biden's climate policy was radical compared to the standard 2016 platform. And in the wake of George Floyd's murder, the entire party, top to bottom, called for fundamentally rethinking policing. So how do we get to where we are now? First, recall that it was Bernie Sanders in the Senate and AOC in the House that pushed Republicans to do $2,000 checks rather than just $600. That divided Trump and McConnell, and it delivered both Georgia Senate seats to the party, flipping control of the Senate. Out of the gate, Biden went big with a nearly $2 trillion rescue package and his popularity soared. These politics were all driven by the faction of the party now getting blamed for everything going wrong. But after that package, his agenda stalled and the political conversation turned toward his handling of COVID. Democrats became associated with the party of lockdowns and school closures. Corporate DEI training began seeping into public schools and being lumped in with critical race theory. And all of that collided with changes in policy around transgender rights, which the right wing has been effectively weaponizing while the left has basically ignored it. In Loudoun County, for instance, it all collided in one story that was played on loop in conservative media but largely went undiscussed in the mainstream press. A father was physically dragged out of a school board hearing trying to confront the board over his daughter having been allegedly assaulted by a trans boy in a bathroom. It turned out the story was much, much different than the right-wing press had originally led on, but it still played a significant role in the public debate, and Loudoun County was a place where Democrats lost as big a vote share as they did anywhere. The short version is that Republicans are finding success in three culture war areas, the fight over sports and trans rights, resistance to corporate DEI-style trainings being introduced to schools and relabeled by the right as critical race theory, and COVID restrictions and mandates. If you'll notice, none of those things have anything specific to do with the squad. These are issues the entire party needs to work through and decide where they stand. Or they can just blame the squad. Which do you think they'll go with? Yeah, blame the squad. I, I, was, I was thinking we were finally going to get to a place where I was going to strongly disagree with you, but then after you said, don't blame the squad, then you went through the exact list of things I do think we should be blaming. So I, we, we do agree. Right. You're right. right. And the, the, but the point is, is, it's not the squad. It's not the squad's fault. It's the whole no. party. The, yeah. party. the problems yeah. go much deeper than they want to acknowledge. The problem is people know they're... they're very well appraised of the fact that if they vote for a Democrat, any Democrat, not, ju not right. just AOC, any Democrat, that means the next time there is the smallest, slightest increase in coronavirus cases, everyone will be masked again, their children will be masked in schools again in that jurisdiction where Democrats control, and they might be teaching their kids some weird stuff about what black and white people should divide them, and they hate it. And that's what I think it is. I, it's not the squad. You're right. It's not any one Democratic official. It's a. It's a. It's the party's kind of capture by the forces you just described, which is which is. And, and the Republican Party is obviously in throws to some pretty dark forces, in my opinion. So it's telling that people are more worried about that kind of thing. And you hear a lot of optimistic Democrats saying that by November, case counts are going to be so low that COVID is going to be in the rearview mirror. I think eventually COVID will be in the rearview mirror. But as long as it's close enough, objects are closer than they appear in, yeah. the, in the mirror, as long as it's close enough that, right, that any day you could get a news report that some new Greek letter is 
emerging from some country right. and is coming our way, people are going to be like, uh-oh. Right. What, what's going to happen And next? that legitimately affects people's lives. Like, I never would have thought, it doesn't really matter to me very much whether our mayor is a Democrat or a Republican. All of a sudden, it kind of does matter. In this, in this, I, like, it matters whether I'll have to go to the gym in a mask, whether I don't have kids, but if I did have kids, I aspire to have kids, I'd have to put them in private school or move across the river to Virginia because I wouldn't want them to go through this madness. Uh, it, it, it does matter, and that's a difference not in individual politicians, but D or R. That's yeah. the difference, and that clearly matters to people for good reason. The COVID stuff is, it, it's it, it will only be they will only allow it to not be a thing if it's like absolute zero. Anything more than absolute zero, you, you risk allowing they're going to bring back some of these things. Right, and and the COVID stuff is different than the kind of identity politics that yeah. Hillary Clinton pushed in order to very explicitly defend Wall Street. You know, don't you know, if you if you break up the banks. Uh, that won't end racism. Like that kind of politics where you are very directly putting the existence of racism in front of a policy that is gaining steam. Break up, break up the banks. She, she claims parenthetically, I'll, I'll definitely break up the banks. You don't worry about me. But really what she's saying is she's not going to break up the banks. Right. And, and she's not going <laughs> to do it. If they deserve it. If they deserve it. I love it. She, she, she even caveated her, par- her parenthetical. So what she's saying is what, what you need to focus on is this thing, which she doesn't present any solutions for. Like, what's she going to do about any, any what's she going right. to do about racism? She, she didn't follow it up by saying, and here's how you right. end racism. It's, a, it's actually right. funny how we talk about uh, how Republicans want to have the culture war battle, or they want to they have the political battle be on the terms of the culture war, where their views are more popular or more in, in sync with, with America. Than the, than the Democrats, but Hillary Clinton wanted to do the same thing. Right. That's exactly what she did. Right. She wanted to have the whole thing be about racism, sexism, you know, Leslie Nopeism or something, the, the you know, right. strong woman, et cetera, which is, is hollow to so many people because it doesn't and, resonate right. with and them. And I would say they both want to do it for the exact same reason, to fend off a multiracial working class movement yeah. that would demand real changes to the way that power is structured yeah. in our economy. Yeah, but you're right. Not not really the squad's fault. Kind of being demonized here. Uh, I, I think maybe you could have, uh, you know, maybe during they're 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 very visible, uh, associated with progressive activism. Mm-hmm. So maybe when BLM or even Antifa, not that they're part of Antifa or something, having more of a pronounced effect on our dialogue because right. of who they are as, as very deliberate activist type people, you can kind of use them as stand-ins, but that's not really what we're talking about. Right. Here. And even Mitt Romney marched. That's true. After those protests. That's true. So, well, yeah. I don't think he did the Kinty cloth. He didn't, uh, no, did he, uh, did he read he did. How to Be an Anti-Racist? I uh, guarantee you he picked it up. Well, he did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody should read it to be able to reject yeah. its premises. <laughs> My opinion. Anyway, I'm looking forward to what's on your radar up next. <laughs>